It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce President Judy Wexler and President Emeritus Robert McDermott. 20 years ago, Judy became provost of CIS and under her direction and commitment to integral education, innovative thinking and teaching thrived. In 2016, Judy was appointed president and thanks to her and her dedicated staff, we are now in excellent standing with WASP and have financial and operational strength and are poised for the next phase of growth and flourishing. Robert McDermott was president from 1990 to 1999, and this was also a period of remarkable change and growth. Robert's a scholar, he's an author, and he's a faculty member in the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program. Thanks to both of these leaders, thousands of students have now become alums and positive change makers in 30 countries around the world. We are grateful to both of you uh, for sharing your reflections this morning of the first 53 years of CIS and looking forward to what's next in the future. So maybe to, to uh, kick things off, we could ask the first question. <laughs> Sorry for turning my back, but these, these are the folks <laughs> in conversation. How did the two of you meet? <laughs> And we're both laughing because we didn't, well, we kind of met at CIS. Um, you know, I've lived in the Bay Area since 1968, so I always knew of CIS, but I didn't know CIS. And so my first real encounter with the school was my first real encounter with Robert. We were having a WASC visit. CIS was having a WASC visit. I, on the other hand, was part of the WASC visit. Um, and I was the WASC staff liaison to, um, to the team. And I met Robert that first day when we interviewed, no, the first evening before the visit started, when we had a dinner at Robert and Ellen's apartment. And I got to, I have to admit, Robert, my first impression was Ellen does a fabulous dinner. Um, my second impression was that Robert answered every question with such honesty that um, a, a deeper level of honesty than I was used to when we did those opening dinners. Well, <clears throat> I'm glad you mentioned Ellen because when I was president, Ellen was a kind of babette <laughs> in the sense that, you know, the team would come with suspicious uh, uh, attitudes. I was sure they were going to find terrible whatever else. And then Eleanor would just feed them this fabulous meal and the, <laughs> and the mood changed yes. by an hour and a half later. Um, so that's been quite an important part of my memory of being, which is no longer recent. But in fact, I haven't been asked about being president in a long time because it was a long time ago, really a different institution, but also the same. So when I was here for that WASC visit, I never imagined that I would ultimately be here at CIS. Um, but when I started thinking about leaving CI, leaving um, WASC and going back to a campus, which I desperately missed, I wanted to come to a place in which I was gonna be able to make a difference. So a lot of academic vice president jobs are actually kind of boring. Um, you get to read a lot of other people's reports, you sign your name on it, you say yes or no, but you don't have that much opportunity to really impact change. CIS seemed to be a place that I could impact change. Little did I know what, uh, what that really meant. Um, but I came to CIS from a very different kind of background than what you had when you came, because I taught I mean, after I got my doctorate at Berkeley, I taught at Holy Names. Um, so I was at a Catholic university for well over 20 years. I had never met a nun before I um, went to work there, before I had my interview. That was my first time talking to a, a, a nun. And I was really wondering what that was going to be like. Um, and then I was at WASC. Um, and so a very different kind of background for coming here, very strong in understanding higher education and very interested in the meaning of the spiritual and transformative dimension. 
but you came differently. I came differently. <laughs> I knew a lot of nuns. <laughs> I was taught by nuns. And then at Manhattanville, my first position from 1964 to 1970 was a, uh, an upper, upper class Catholic school. Uh, and the president of that school was a person who uh, uh, hired me, but then later introduced me to Lawrence Rockefeller and later became chair of the board. Of, so this is this sort of karma to the max. Um, uh, and so, yes, I did know Aridas Chaudhary. And so I was attracted to, to the school, not because I wanted to be president, but because I loved the school. Entirely different. Uh, uh, attitude. Um, I wasn't averse to being an administrator, but it hadn't been my career. And then when I stopped, I stopped. <laughs> so the different, right. very different. And yet we've worked well together. We have worked well together. I think in part because of our differences and our ability, actually, we both have a good ability to listen, right? And um, be able to agree and disagree um, well, because we don't always agree on things, um, but we don't uh, we don't fight over them. Is really there's respect. Yes, always. Crucial. That's crucial. So much of higher education is competitive in a way that does not include respect. So one of the things that I always appreciated about you, Robert, when we when I was provost, was that I thought you were the best former president that I had ever seen. You know, I, I visited a lot of schools, so I've seen a lot of former presidents who would often start a conversation with me, something like, well, in my day, and you knew as soon as they said that they were going to say something disparaging about whoever the current person was, but you never did that. Um, both when Joe was president and certainly as I've been president, you've been available for advice and for bouncing things off um, but you've always been a supportive colleague. And I think that's, um, that's a particular kind of, of skill and personality that lets somebody do that. So I wanna publicly thank you for that. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate hearing that. One of the reasons it would be ill-advised and almost comical to say in my day with respect to uh, being president is because it was hardly the same institution you know, people would, would come onto the board or come onto the faculty and they might say to me, uh, oh, I want to meet with you because I want to hear about the institution. And I was inclined to say, actually, it'd be better if you didn't. <laughs> because not just because some of it was not edifying, but because it was really different. It was, it's the difference between adolescence and young adulthood and you know, real maturity. Well, it's the same, you know, it's the same person, but then again, it, you, can't, you, you can't assume that what worked then would work now. I mean, for example, uh, we would be pleased to get a faculty with such and such an accomplishment, but 20 years later, that would be sort of minimal. Right, expected. So the standards went up with students, with faculty, with administrators. You know, I, uh, <laughs> when I was appointed president, I, I hadn't been a dean or a vice president or a provost. I was a faculty member. So, <laughs> so you know, uh, that, would, that should never have happened later. It couldn't have happened later. Um, so it's a, the school has really evolved in such a way that what I learned or what I did became, quickly became irrelevant. Parts of it became irrelevant, but I think what's, what, part of what's special about CIS is that the founding mission is compelling and it has lots of room for growth and development. And so when I came here and I, one of the first things that I did was invite fa all faculty to come and meet with me individually. Um, and as people came and, and faculty, that's when I fell in love with this place because listening to the faculty talk about their work, their program, their teaching, the kind of education that they were going to, they were trying to provide was absolutely compelling. And it goes back to that founding mission. And so part of what's been, you know, interesting, the, actually the most interesting part to me about CIS is to keep on reflecting back to that founding mission and okay, what does that mean now? How does it change? 
How does it need to evolve? Um, because it is a different world, good grief. The world that we're in right now is different than it was 18 months ago, um, much less in 1968. But there's still, a, there's a thread there that carries through that I think is really, really important. Yeah, what well, you're calling a thread uh, is a, you know, I think it's an accurate word. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it, um, it sort of, uh, what? It introduces a complexity. When does the thread cease to be the thread? When does, when, uh, so it has a spiritual mission, but it doesn't have a religion. So if it had a religion, there would be sign, you know, it has this idea, this, this text, this teacher, this, etc. but it doesn't have that. So spiritual is in all the religions and it's in no religion as well. So that's complicated and challenging. And I think terribly important to, to, to have a school that has that sophistication and imagination to maintain a commitment to spiritual without uh, becoming uh, sort of nothing on the one hand or dogmatic and fixed on the other. Oh, that's been hard and good. So, what, so early on when I, when I came, we were preparing for a WASC visit. And at that point, WASC was letting us do thematic things. And so one of our themes is, was integral education. And we had this absolutely wonderful committee that met for many years after the WASC visit. I think just because we really love talking about what we meant by integral education. It was so much fun, but it was also really, really deep. And um, as part of that, we did a survey of um, certainly a faculty, I don't remember who else, um, about what they meant by integral education. And we got a whole range of things with, but with certain themes that came up. And what was interesting is you could, it almost went department by, by department, not that some didn't have some of those themes, but what was the most important? And it led me to really talk a lot in those days about We've got this common understanding of what we want to do, but we don't have an orthodoxy. And that not having an orthodoxy is really impor important so that we're not evaluating people on, do you follow tenants A, B, C, and D? But we are looking at, do you represent the whole? Are you an integral representation? And that part of that, you know, for me, when, I, when people ask me about CIS and what's important, you know, I say that at our best, we don't always achieve it, but at our best, we have this balance between a rigorous academic education and a deep approach to helping our students and ourselves go deeply into themselves and to build their understanding and be able to then manifest that in their world. And that's a really, really powerful set of goals. And keeping it in balance is what I think is unique about CIS because lots of places, one or the other of those is primary and then the other one starts to disappear. No, I, I think <clears throat> that's accurate <laughs> and uh, inspiring. Um, uh, I think it started out with this word integral that was introduced as the name of the school in 1981. Uh, and one way to think about it is that uh, it's Sri Aurobindo's word, which has to do with the transformation of knowledge and action and, and uh, devotion or love. So it's the perfect word. On the other hand, it's, it's, it can be used to mean anything. Uh, so, uh, the intent initially was thinking, feeling, and willing, and the integration. But then, pretty soon, it became body, mind, and spirit. And then it could be, you know, just body and mind. And then you say, well, then, then there's an argument. And then, right. well, you know, well, maybe we don't. Maybe we should include that word spirit, but we don't know what it means. And and so the the argument goes. I shouldn't call it an argument necessarily, but, but certainly. Um, 
a, a long uh, discussion. And I think we're in pretty good shape while it's a, an alive discussion. And when it becomes irrelevant, I think we've lost it. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's important that we don't have a definition of spirit because if it comes down to it, I think you and I, for example, have different definitions of what that means. And, you know, and as a sociologist that different cultures have very different understandings about what spirit means. And so part of, I think our, our task and our challenge is to make space for those understandings and some way that people can have, be in, in, in exchange with each other around these kind of ideas. You know, I think one of the challenges that's in our larger society that of course appears in CIS is we don't really know what it means to have to live in a society that's really diverse. And I think when, we, when we're talking about spirit, that we're, we're in a sense, we're modeling that. You have to have room for um, very different kinds of understandings and respect that um, we know this in a different way, but we're both striving towards some similar set of, of some similar goal um, in terms of understanding some, what, what's bigger than us and what, how, do we, how do we relate to, um, to a world that's, and a universe that's much larger than our individual yeah. being. For example, how do we relate to WASC? <laughs> and are we able to explain to them that you know we're not a cult, we're not an ashram, we're a real school, and we're trying to do something that most that most universities don't include. Or a lot of universities say they do, but they don't seriously do it. And um, and so Wask often wants to look at us as a religious school, which we're really not. Um, but I think one of the ways in which having worked at WASC really was helpful to CIS is that I could translate what we do here into WASC language. And I could also translate the WASC language into folks here because Anne would keep on reminding me like, Judy, these words don't make sense. Like, what are they talking about? Um, and that for any school, um, you need to have somebody that really understands WASPs to do well in relation to it. So I think that background really helped. Yes, it helps a lot to know a range of terms. You know, it's different to talk about, uh, if you say, if you're involved, if in a conversation with the Buddhist, the term God is not very helpful, right. you know. And similarly, when you're talking to WASP, you want to know when to use the word depth or, so that they can understand that what you mean, you don't just mean more scholarship, you mean a different kind of thinking. And so, and then they're not always interested in hearing that. No, they're not. But I think the piece that they are interested in hearing and that we often don't do enough in a visit. So, and we have a visit coming up in a couple of years. So remember this is that um, they are interested in hearing about pedagogy. They are interested in hearing from faculty how they think about their teaching and what they're trying to achieve in their classes. And part of what really um, made me love CIS was the faculty's commitment and thoughtfulness about teaching. That teaching wasn't just something that I mean, stand up in the front of the room and I'll say what I want and you take what you, what you will from it but they were really thoughtful about how to make it work and what they were trying to achieve. That was can understand, and that is really a compelling part of I think what we're trying to, to do here, that if you want people to be, to learn something and go deep into themselves, you really have to think, be thoughtful about how you make both of those things happen. They don't happen accidentally. Right. I was nervous about anything we would send to WASC, but I was never nervous about the team coming and talking to the faculty or going into a classroom. Or what I especially appreciated, if, if they would read the titles of the dissertations from the commencement. There we, you would see range, uh, but you would also see tremendous originality steeped in, in learning. 
And I, 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 I remember several visits when they would say, this is really interesting. <laughs> but they weren't talking about our initial reports, so which they didn't always get. But then when they heard the faculty talking or students talking, they would say, actually, this is, yeah, I can see this. Well, there's many a commencement in which the whoever was getting the honorary degree, when they were listening to the titles of the dissertations, right. would lean over and whisper to me, now I understand <laughs> yes. of what you really what you really do. Yes. Or sometimes, oh, this is this is fabulous. I really, yes. you know, I, I want to see that. Yes, because they're about transformation. They're about journey. They're about discovery. Uh, they're, they're not, it's not dry it's scholarship, but not dry scholarship. It's, 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 it's so much of it, it's alive with consequence. So one of the things that we did a number of years ago, I lose track of exactly how many, because really I feel like I just came here yesterday um, and I'm leaving tomorrow. So it's, you know, it's been fast. Um, was that when we, we got together and we created that dissertation proposal rubric. So the research committee, another committee that really loved meeting because we talked about such important things. Um, but we talked about, you know, what is it, what, what makes a good dissertation proposal? What's going to then lead to being a good dissertation? What are our standards of ex, um, and expectations? And I thought that was a really important moment here when we were able to bring together that kind of WASC assessment um, mentality with um, what had been previously maybe an unstated set of goals. Um, and that, because I was reading every dissertation proposal, um, the quality of the proposals really went up. Yep. Um, and in part because the students could look at the rubric and they could say, oh, that's what they're looking for. I can do that. Um, and certainly when I did my dissertation, I had no clue what they were really looking for. Right. right. And the reason that the student could say, when the student said they are looking for, the, the student is talking about a professor who has done a similar dissertation. And so, so this, it's a content, it's, it really is mentoring uh, in a, well, in multiple ways of knowing one of our seven commitments. So it is mentoring, but it's also trying to take the standards from being out there and having the student be able to look at their own work and evaluate it and say, I need to do a little more here before I hand it to the professor. So it changes, I think it gives students more agency um, and more understanding of what are, how does it, what does it mean to be a scholar without just modeling on the faculty member that is their dissertation chair? Because I used to see a lot of dissertations that I could, I didn't have to look to see who the chair was. I would know who they were modeling on. And I think it's, there was still certainly elements of that, but there was more independence also. Yeah. I, I think, uh, a little phrase that I've used sometimes is it's scholarship plus yeah. <laughs> or it's or it's scholarship with with a certain kind of personal depth that isn't always prized uh, in the in the academy. Um, so. so, you know, one of the things that I did want to say something about before we end is um, because I get asked this a lot as I'm leaving, is what am I proudest of? What am I most excited about? And I want to say something about that because the dissertation proposal, the rubric that we did that work on deciding what scholarship meant here is one of the things that I'm both proud of and excited about. I am really proud of the way in which we rose to the occasion um, in 2016 and we changed our financial situation and that we moved this school to a place in which we could attract great candidates to be president and that we can hand them resources that they can do their job. I'm really proud of that. I am proud of the way we have been coming through this pandemic. Um, if ever there was a test of being able to let go and change, um, the last 18 months have been that. 
And as we see today, as we are sitting here in this room without everybody else, it's an ongoing um, challenge. The parts that excited me the most were the parts in, in working with the faculty. Um, there's an opportunity to be creative at CIS that I hope is always going to be part of um, the future of this school. And so creative in the ways that Arisa and I were when we created the, the fifth um, Thursday diversity trainings, creative in the way that we were when we created community mental health and human sexuality and integral and transpersonal psychology and added more online when that seemed you know, appropriate. And um, those things are, they're gratifying, they're thriving, and it's also really exciting. Um, that's where as an administrator, you get to also have some of the benefits that go with being a faculty member and being a scholar and that you're not, it's not just looking at spreadsheets as important as they are, um, but I don't get up in the morning thinking, yes, today I get to look at a spreadsheet, but I do get up in the morning and then I'm excited about what we do to constantly be reflecting on our time here, where we are in 2021, and what we think the world needs from CIS and how we build on that um, going forward. And, you know, there were a lot of schools that started in 1968, and a lot of them, most of them are no longer here. And Many of them, I think, made the mistake of trying to grow by becoming a comprehensive university. We did not make that mistake. So kudos to us, Robert. We didn't make that mistake. Um, that we have tried to keep on building and reflecting and cycling back and moving forward based on our um, original mission so that People came here in, I imagine, in 1968. We could check with Mike Hebel and ask him. Um, for some of the same reasons that they come now, looking at meaning, looking at this integration of, um, of depth and um, academic success. But what that means is different than it was in 1968. And what it's going to mean in 2030 is going to be different from what it means in, in 2021. But as long as we're still asking those questions, I think CIS has enormous opportunity and is a really important place to, con to continue that we've got, we have a, a mission to um, within higher education to be that prod to create new things, um, to take risks that other schools don't take. And we and we could come up with a list of the ways in which other universities follow behind us, um, as we have seen with um, the, the certificate program in psychedelic theories and you know, in, uh, psychedelic therapies. Right. That's such a good statement. I'm inclined not to say anything, but I do want to add how many times you said we. Yeah. And so people say to me, what, is, what was your foremost accomplishment, uh, which was a question you were prepared right. to answer. And I, I, I'm inclined to say when I'm asked that question, I didn't accomplish anything, but I was part of a team that made many things happen that wouldn't have happened. And uh, it, it, on the one hand, a president can really mess up a school. But on the other hand, there's very little the president can do alone. Right. It, it can actually, negatively, it can be a little lonely because there's nobody else at the same level. At the same time, it's quite uh, the challenge of being in that position is also uh, quite wonderful because it's it just dependent on so many, you know, right. the dependent up and sideways and down, etc. Yes. And and I, when you were speaking, you were not saying I did, I did, no. I did, and you don't think that way. No, I don't. You 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 recognize that you were the leader of a team, and without it. Without that teamwork, all those wonderful advances would not have taken place. That's right. And our team has gotten stronger and stronger and stronger. 
Yeah. Um, and, and as I look out at you, even though I can't see you at this moment, so really my thanks for all that each one of you has enabled us to do collectively. We are where we are today because of all of us. And thank you. Judy, thank you, Robert. Yay, thank you. Thank you.